Howdy! It is my pleasure to welcome you to this presentation of the Texas A&M Chemistry Roadshow. My name is Dr. Jim Pennington and I'm an Instructional Associate Professor in the Chemistry Department at Texas A&M University. In addition to teaching organic chemistry, I'm the coordinator for the Texas A&M Chemistry Roadshow. This program has a more than 35 year history and I'm proud to have been part of that history for the past 13 years. The Chemistry Roadshow is presented 8 to 90 times per year at schools, libraries, and other institutions all across the state of Texas with a total audience of around 20,000 annually. We're especially proud and honored by the opportunities we've had to collaborate with the George and Barbara Bush Foundation. Today's program is sponsored by the George and Barbara Bush Foundation and is made possible by the Education Department of George Bush Presidential Library and Museum. The late President and First Lady Barbara Bush advocated for and supported scientific research, particularly cancer research, throughout their adult lives, having lost their young daughter Robin to leukemia. The research they advocated for and supported has led to treatments and cures that have improved the life and saved the lives of many children over the years. Uh, with that, I hope you enjoy our presentation today of the Texas A&M Chemistry Roadshow. So, again, if you go around the state doing this roadshow, lots of places will call this a chemistry magic show. People like the idea of magic, of course, because magic, you don't actually have to do work. You just kind of pop the top off the bottle, the genie comes out and just does all the work for you. Yeah, not bad. You have pretty decent genie going today. Unfortunately, no genie. Lots of heat, lots of steam, very excellent reaction, but no genie. Part of our purpose of this presentation is to help all those students and families in the interim that all that hard work they're doing in school, the reading, the writing, the math, the science, will actually let them do some pretty cool, some pretty interesting things as they go on in their academic career. We hope to show you guys some of those things today. Now, like I said, lots of people call this a chemistry magic show. Now, this show was actually started about 35 years ago by Dr. John Hall. He hated it when people called this a chemistry magic show. He said, look, it's not magic, it's science. Science. So I'd be one of his favorite textbooks. I guess I should put on a uniform if we're talking about magic. Yeah. Bring his favorite textbook just to get a good working definition of what we mean by the difference between magic and science before we get started. Ah, uh, there it is. So with magic, we're trying to hide things, we're trying to confuse people, we're trying to obfuscate. With science, we're trying to explain the natural world. How things actually work. Now, if people were here, I'd ask, is that magic or science? That one's, that's magic, I'm not going to explain that one. But we'll try to explain most of the stuff they do, at least a little bit, give you enough information. So if you do have questions later, you can contact us, you can go to the library, you can dig in, do some research on your own. We'll try to give you enough information to get you started without a big, long, boring lecture. The first observation I'll ask you to make, can you tell me what this is? Dry ice, right? So, again, now, dry ice, why do you call it dry ice? Because it's not wet. So regular ice made out of water, which from solid to liquid to gas, but dry ice is made out of carbon dioxide, and it's sublimed. It goes from solid directly to gas without stopping at that liquid phase in the middle. Now we all know, should you ever hold dry ice in your bare hands? Of course not, unless you're an idiot. Or well trained, one of the two. I've been doing this for a few years. This is minus 78 degrees Celsius. It will give you frostbite if you're not careful. But notice I'm moving around my hands pretty quickly so it doesn't come into close contact with my skin. Now, to help us observe that sublimation process a little bit better, we've got here just some water, some baking food coloring in it. So if we put a few chunks of dry ice in there, we can observe it bubble and smoke like we used to see in dry ice. That helps observe that sublimation process even better yet. What we've got here is just some bubble solution, like little kids will bubble in the summertime. So once again, you guys said, help me out, make some observations. A little bit slower than usual, but not bad. So, carbon dioxide gas. Is it lighter or heavier than air? Heavy, yeah. Fall down, the lighter go up. What color is carbon dioxide gas? Somebody probably thinks white, right? And we should say white because it looks white. But then we think a little harder going, no, wait a minute, we know a few more things. We've got some more data. What's in the air that we breathe into it? We breathe in, oxygen, we exhale, carbon dioxide. And I don't think anybody's at home blowing smoke rings. 
So apparently the carbon dioxide is clear, so the carbon dioxide is clear. We still have trouble with explanation. Why are the bubbles white? Well, nice rain day, what do we see in the sky? We see clouds, that's where the rain's coming from. Basically what we're doing is we're just condensing the moisture here. We're making clouds. Yeah. All right. Now, the first few demonstrations, we honestly, are just sort of magic, tricky things to get everybody's attention on. But as we go on through the roadshow, we actually do have a couple of serious things that we're trying to, to, to do and trying to accomplish. First of all, we understand not all of our students actually want, want to have careers in science. That's fine. But we should use a career path, especially interesting, especially meaningful, especially useful for them. We would like all of the students, no matter what they do for their job, to at least enjoy science, appreciate science. Heck, at least not be afraid of science. On the other hand, we don't really motivate some of the students we interact with to at least consider that possibility. Maybe they would be interested in the scientific career field, chemistry, physics, biology, engineering, things like that. I feel like it's important that I be honest with them. If you do go into a career in science, you don't spend most of your time doing magic tricks. You spend most of your time trying to fix things that are broken, trying to solve real problems that people actually have. Well, one of the real problems that we have is that we make lots and lots and lots of junk. We throw lots of stuff away. It's really wasteful. It's really expensive. If we could find a fast, cheap, easy way to recycle things, like paper and plastic and wood and metal and all that, that would be really beneficial. Also be pretty profitable. So lots of research groups here at Texas A&M and a lot of other places are working on ways to recycle things. And one of my friends over the material science department at Texas A&M is specifically working on a process for recycling glass. And she was kind enough to let borrow a little bit of this fluid that she developed that glass recycling process. Now, I brought some of my own books of glass from the lab to kind of show you how this works. So, put just a little bit in there. That should be enough for demonstration purposes. Now, I need to get this mixed up pretty quickly before reaction starts. And then you just go a little bit of time to do it. It's a pretty fast reaction. Should be finished just about now. We get a nice, brand new beaker out. Not bad. Did I just make a beaker in 10 seconds? No. But for that long, you believe me. So, again, so the special thing here is this is just vegetable oil. The vegetable oil has the same refractive index as glass. That means it bends light the same way that glass does. So little beakers in the whole time. We just couldn't see it. Where did the broken glass go? Inside the little beaker. But we just can't see it. Just can't see it yet. A little bit of a trick, the good science will have different materials interact with light. But you guys have experienced that concept of bending light before. If you ever show the corner of an aquarium, and the same little fish is like swimming over here and over here at the same time, because the water splits the light in two directions. So it looks like there's two fish, even though there's only one. Oh, yeah. So I have my, my assistant sort of introduce themselves to me, so if you can tell me. Hello, my name is Anna. Yeah, she was kind enough to me. Uh, volunteer to help the state. So this next demonstration, it's a classic. Most people have probably heard of it, some people have probably even seen it before, but it's too much fun not to do. So now there's one thing about this demonstration, I gotta admit, so many times as I've done it, I can't quite figure it out. For some reason, my colleagues, folks that I've worked with, always want to call this one elephant toothpaste. So for the life of me, I can't figure out why they a silly name like that, but maybe you guys can figure something out at home and watch what happens. So the hell put this thing over here for me. So what we're going to do, we're going to put four things in our cylinder here. Now, the first thing, I'm going to add this. This is hydrogen peroxide. You guys probably have some hydrogen peroxide in your medicine cabinet at home. So I want you to think about why you have hydrogen peroxide in your medicine cabinet at home. Now, you have in your medicine cabinet about 3% hydrogen peroxide. This is 30% hydrogen peroxide. So it's 10 times as concentrated, but it's the same compound. Now, the next thing we're going to add is some dish soap. I'm going to add this part. Now, the dish soap. Has nothing at all to do with the reaction, but it's going to help us observe the reaction better. Let's see what we mean by that in a minute. I've got to add exactly that much. Good. Kids show, one fart joke. Got to do it. I don't know. Now, the next thing I'm going to add, that is the blue. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to tilt it and put it on these two sides, and you put it on the other two sides if you want to tilt the glass. Good. Alright, that's it. Now, the last thing that we're going to add is potassium iodide. 
Now you and I, we don't have potassium iodide in our bodies per se, but we do have some enzyme called catalase. When hydrogen peroxide runs through that enzyme in our blood, it does basically the same thing when it runs the potassium iodide, which is this. So then you want one that kind of hard enough so sure it hits the bottom and then you get out of the Now, why would we call that elephant toothpaste? Looks like toothpaste. Now, on a side note, I'm guessing, I'm hoping there's probably some teachers and adults that have done maybe work with kids and all, and maybe you'll want to do this demonstration with your kids someday. Let me give you one important pro tip if you decide to do this demonstration. You got to remember to use the red, and the blue food color, not the brown food color. Instead, it's elephant something, something else. <laughs> I know, I know, crappy joke. I'm sorry, you go with what you got. Anyway, back to the original question, hydrogen peroxide. Why do we have hydrogen peroxide in our medicine caps? What do we use it for? We put it on cuts, scrapes, boobs, keep from getting infected. Hydrogen peroxide breaks down into pure oxygen gas and water. That's why the bubbles are, it's pure oxygen. It's a really bad environment for bacteria to grow in. So next time you get a cut or a scrape work, I hope you don't get a cut or a scrape. Next time somebody at home is cooking a steak or hamburger, some kind of raw meat, and it's still pretty fresh, but it still have that active enzyme in it. So as long as that raw meat put like a Dixie cup or something, pour some hydrogen peroxide on it, and you can observe those oxygen bubbles forming on the surface. Don't go big and foamy like this because of all the soap and everything. But again, it allows us to directly observe that biological process as it happens. And yeah, we'll let that keep oozing for a bit. One of the things that most people kind of like about our presentation is that we blow things up. To start with, our cannon. Now, usually if there's an audience, I'll kind of point it around the audience, but because that doesn't really work today. Um, why can I do that? Because this cannon doesn't actually shoot anything out of the air, it just makes a big noise. And all the parents at home will be terrified to know we used to sell this thing as a children's toy. <laughs> but a six year old kid on the box went, because it doesn't actually shoot anything out of the air. If you have ever known or been a six-year-old, how long do you think it takes to figure out how to make it shoot something out of the end? <laughs> Usually the little sibling's doll's head or something. They let the kids play with it. What we use it for with the college students is to teach them to come combustion or fire. There are three things you gotta have for a fire. At home, hopefully you're kind of running them through your mind. You gotta have oxygen, you gotta have heat, and you gotta have fuel. Okay, so wood, charcoal, gas, and some kind of good soda. Uh, where are we going to get the oxygen from? We're going to get that from the barrel around us. For the heat, we have a lovely little sparking mechanism here. Now, down in the can, we got some water. So, down in the can, we got some water. Water does not fuel, water does not burn. Uh, in the ammunition box, well, okay, a couple of rivers in Ohio. That's a completely different story. <laughs> now, in the can, I'm going to put some calcium carbide. Calcium carbide is also not a fuel. Calcium carbide cannot burn. But calcium carbide reacts with water to make a acetylene gas. So it gives it low torches. That burns pretty darn good. So I'm going to load it, I'm going to count to five, and then I'm going to fire it off. Now, if there are some people here in the audience, I'm going to ask everybody, please cover your ears. I'm going to put the earmuffs on, my earplugs on as well, because some of this stuff's going to be louder than you guys expect as well. I'm going to load it, count to five, fire it. One, two, three, four. Seven, five, yeah. <laughs> now you guys have actually seen this before. Have you ever seen like old fashioned black and white photographs of coal miners down on the ground, like that lamp on their forehead? The way that worked was the mechanism they would load up the calcium carbide pellets. The mechanism would slowly drip the water on the calcium carbide, generate the assembly gas, faster drip the water, faster generate the gas, right into the flame. Now, this demonstration reminds me of another demonstration. It's kind of a seasonal one. Um, my wife and I, Bobby, we, we like to decorate for the holidays and all. But yeah, we're kind of running out of time because we get really busy around the holidays. We like to decorate for Halloween and things to be Christmas. So Halloween, one of my favorite things is I like to have some jack o' lanterns around the house. But it takes a lot of time to carve them all. So I've tried to come up with a good, like, science solution to that problem. So now what I've got, and so the, the Canon demonstration kind of gave me an idea. So what I've got here, I've got a I had to take the guts out first. Now inside, I got a little bowl of water and some water in it. Now, I'm going to take some of that same calcium carbide that we use for the can. I'm going to pour that in the bowl of water. And that's a carbon pumpkin. <laughs> Come up, but we're going to have a little contest. Okay? Actually, yeah, come 
that from Vector Optical Sort. So, um, we have, each of us, a lovely Wellington China balloon, very sharp skew. Now, if I were just to stick the balloon, what's going to happen? Pop, might pop. It actually might, because I'm not very good at this one. It's like I got these two up here, so mine fails, softly will hopefully work. We're going to try this on this little race to see who can make a balloon. Shishkabop. Remember what a shishkabop is? Stuff on a stick. All right. Play your mark. Get set. Go. Unusual in the chemistry lab. 
I've only been able to find about three or four reactions that do this. Most of them don't even change color. You have to have electrodes and the resistance of the solution change. Ah, but well, this happens all the time. Inside you and inside me, our bodies are designed so we don't waste things. You may go to one thing, your body can do something else. You may go to that, your body can do something else. So depending on how old you are and what class you had, you either will have or have had classes like biology or biochemistry and things like that. In those classes, you'll learn about things like the credit cycle, the citric acid cycle, the glucose cycle, inside our own teeny tiny cells that recycle and recycle and recycle. And this is a way to demonstrate that concept visually for students. Now, there is one reagent that eventually does get used up and the cycle will stop. But it should go through at least a few more iterations. One of the moving things around me, I am reminded that I unfortunately did forget one thing while getting everything set up today. And that is, I forgot to grab breakfast. I know, I know. <laughs> Doesn't look like a Miss Baby breakfast in my day. <laughs> the problem is, my blood sugar drops on me, bad things happen. So I just have to put an emergency supply of gummy bears up here in case I sugar tanks on me. Party for just a second, we grab an emergency gummy bear and be back to the show. Yeah! Yeah! Yeah. Now I like gummy bears, but there is a problem with them. Every once in a while they make a bad one. By bad, I don't mean broccoli flavor. I mean a pure gummy bear. I think I A pure gummy bear. You can't eat it. You can't just throw it away. Whatever you do, do not flush it down the toilet. They breathe down there. That's where the big gummy gators come from. If you're running pure gummy bear. So that's what we're going to do. Now, in order to do that, I got to do this. This is this white powder is potassium chloride. It's a strong oxidizing agent. It's not white stuff, it's a little match in it. It's sort of striking the match. So, look, I got to get this melt. So, while that's melting, let me ask you all some pertinent and relevant questions. Um, why do we eat gummy bears? Because they are. Delicious. Why are they delicious? Because they are sweet. Why are they sweet? Because they almost entirely are oh, sugar. Now, in addition to tasting good, what does sugar do for us? What does it give us? Cavities. No, that's labeled. First, it gives us energy. Yes, have you ever seen a little brother or sister? The entire bag of jelly beans in the pool and you see for about half an hour. You've seen this process. So, the point of this demonstration is to show us how much energy there is in one evil. Gummy bear. All right, let me move this out of the way. All right, gummy bear. Time to meet your confectioner. Dance, gummy bear! Dance! That is one particularly evil gummy bear. For those in the room, it's going to smell like burnt marshmallows in here for 20 minutes. Or as I like to call it, He's still going. He just won't die. <laughs> yeah. Okay, one X coming here. I'll put him over here. But the next set of demonstration we're gonna do have to do um, with acids and bases and indicators. Now, first of all, what do I mean by indicators? Well, remember, I'm a chemist. This is a chemistry department. We work with atoms, we work with molecules. Can we see, can you see? What the atoms and molecules are doing? No, too small. If I was a biologist, if I could work with you know, mice, rats, guinea pigs, whales, zebras, everything, I could see what they're doing, but I can't directly see what the atoms and molecules I'm studying are doing. So I have to have something to indicate what's going on. Now, that indication could be a color change, could be bubbles from, could be a blip on a computer screen, something you and I can observe. To tell us what's going on. So these next couple of illustrations specifically have to do with indicators 
for acid and base reactions. Now this first one, this one actually has some interesting medical applications. Now most of the folks out there are probably a little bit too old for this, but especially for little tiny kids, really little kids. There are two things that little kids just hate about going to the doctors. First one is shots. You still can't do anything about shots. What's the other one? It's needles. They got stick your finger to get the blood out. Don't you hate that? Wouldn't it be so much better if the doctor could just kind of spray the kid's hand with something and get the blood out that way? Wouldn't that be cool? Now I like you guys, but as for our insurance policy, no bleeding up here. <laughs> so especially here is the spread. This is just a one window thing. Especially here is the paper. It's called goldenrod paper. Now they used to just sell this the photocopies are well. They still sell some of what they call gold rubber, but unfortunately for us, they had to change the dye because it was gumming up the copy machines. What they used to use to make gold rod paper this nice sort of orangish yellowish colors, and that most of y'all probably have on your spice rack at home. It's called turmeric, which is a lot of cooking, especially Indian cooking, because it comes from a root from a plant from India. Most of the digital indicators came from various plant sources, flowers, leaves, roots, things like that. In cooking, the turmeric is basically used to make food this nice yummy golden color. Basic conditions like ammonia it turns bright blood red. Hmm. Stained blood red though? Hmm. Yeah. As it evaporates, it goes back to that orange yellowish color. So if you can get a hold of some of the old fashioned gold rod paper, or it's actually getting a little bit harder to find anymore. There's some relatively simple recipes online for making gold rod paper. Now, this is kind of a get an adult involved sort of a product. You get like eat some stuff on the stove and all. It's no more difficult than making dinner, basically. But if you buy or make some of the old fashioned gold on paper, you can do some fun experiments at home. Take some ammonia window cleaner, laundry ammonia, fingertip, or a q tip, and you can uh, write secret messages or draw secret pictures. And then let them evaporate. And do it all over again. And pretty much spray it, that works too. This next demonstration, I gotta admit, this is my absolute favorite demonstration to do while I'm on the road. This one's called Rainbow Magic. Now, as I've said, so, well, first of all, why is it called Rainbow Magic? Well, I've got a little box here, and in my little box, I have six little beakers. I also have a pitcher of water. Now, if this works out right, what should happen is as I have the water from the one pitcher to each of the six beakers, I should get all six colors of the rainbow in order. So I think at home, in order, what are the six colors of the rainbow? We've got red, then orange, then Yellow, then green, then blue, and finally we have purple, or indigo, or violet, whatever your teacher called it. We're going to call it purple. Now, before I go any further, this is a brief pause, and oh, good, Dan's here. Um, make sure you get another picture. Because he, he's helping, not, he hasn't only helped with this, he's helping a lot, but I want to make sure I give him a little bit of extra attention and credit, because again, above and beyond everything else he's done, you guys didn't see, because again, you watched the other videos and everything, I was running late today. <laughs> of all the demonstrations we do, this is the one that takes the most precision, most accuracy, most talent and skill to set up correctly. And I was just running out of time. I was just terrified I wasn't going to even get to do this one for you. But Dan stepped up to the plate, and I wanted to thank him uh, for doing that. I wanted to give him credit for two reasons. Number one, I really appreciate all this stuff. Number two, if it doesn't work, it's just fine. Okay, good. All right, what were the colors again? We got Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. Good. So, red! It's okay. Every once in a while, one or two. Orange! Uh, maybe yellow? What's your two? Green? Now, I know for an absolute fact that Dan's a far better chemist than this. He didn't mess it up. Maybe I'm messing it up. Let's see. Anybody see anything happening? Look. He didn't mess it up. I am messing it up. Not adding enough. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and. You guys have all done enough crafts and projects and everything at home, and also know whenever you do something big and messy like this, you're not finished. Until you do what? Clean it up. So, red. 
you said, breakfast burritos. <laughs> Was his tail hard like that when you put it in there? Mm. I have to think about that. Now, this next demonstration, if you have ever seen any demonstration before, like the night you have seen this one. I think you like So, I just transfer my liquid nitrogen to this other reservoir. Now, if I were to take a flower, and I were to stick it into the liquid nitrogen, at minus 321 degrees, what's going to happen to the flower? And they're going to freeze, because what are flowers mostly made out of? They're mostly made out of water, just like all of these things, mostly made out of water. So we can predict that our flower here will indeed freeze. Try to slow motion, come on, guys. Just honestly, you will. 
So to prove how madly I can be, so I stick my hand in the middle of the night. So there's like three little sadists up front going, yeah! So for those three, we'll do it. Smoking jacket. <laughs> Does that prove how really macho I am? Yeah. My wife thinks so, she kind of likes it. Ah! Now, you know, you've seen this before, it's called the Lighting Boss Effect. Have you ever seen an old, old Western movie? There's a blacksmith, he's got a red, hot horseshoe, pounds on the horseshoe, pounds on the horseshoe, he's the red, hot horseshoe, tossed in a cold bucket of water. What happens? Instantly boils the water. Remember, mine is 321 degrees compared to the liquid nitrogen. My hand is like that red hot portion. Instantly boils the liquid nitrogen. It creates a vapor layer around my hand that protects the liquid nitrogen and never touched my hand. If all y'all had been here, you could have come up and held me down, kicking and screaming, because I would have been kicking and screaming, <laughs> with my hand stuck in the liquid nitrogen. But why I've had that, I finally took it out. Nothing, because my hand was really solid shattered, just like the flower. I'm mostly made out of water, too. In our facts. You've also seen this before if you're ever out in the kitchen. You've got a nice hot frying pan. You drink cold water on a hot frying pan. This immediately hit the frying pan. And yeah, it kind of skitters around on its own steam. That's that same. Why do you that? So this demonstration, for obvious reasons, is called the blue bottle. Now, the idea is, I'm going to add some of that same sodium hydroxide solution we've been using to the blue bottle. Now, when I first add it, nothing is supposed to happen. What I'm going to ask you guys to do is keep an eye on that blue bottle for me while I start setting up the next demonstration. I'm going to trust you guys, and I'll trust the guys here in the audience, to let me know if anything interesting happens. Okay, so while you guys are keeping an eye on that, I'm going to start setting up this next demonstration. This is called elemental colors. But the idea is, if you've ever seen anything about well, the stars, the planets, the solar system, either maybe you had to study for school, or maybe you went to a museum, or maybe you read something, you've heard, you've been told, you've read things like the sun is made out of a certain amount of hydrogen, a certain amount of helium, a certain amount of iron, and other elements. Well, there's a natural question that any good student ought to have. And that is, how do they know? Let's see that in the bottom. It's still thinking about it. Hmm. Oh, it's slow today. Again, whole room. All right. So, again, you've ever studied you know, the stars, the plants, the solar system. You've heard them say things like the sun waves, hydrogen, helium, iron, argon, a few other elements. The natural question is, how do they know? It's not like you can go to the sun and pick up a sand. Oh, sand. Let's see. It's starting to do something. No, ah, maybe I just didn't look at it right because that's still cool. Darn it. Well, maybe it'll let me know if anything really happens. Okay. So, all the colors, stars, planets, solar system, um, can't be of samples. Um, so, I guess, how do they know what those two things are made of? Well, it turns out when different elements and molecules are heat. It's the lighting in here, but I. Eh, it's still cool. You guys don't know if anything cool. Anyway, okay. So, you can't go to the sun and pick up a sample. So how do you know it's made? Well, it turns out again, those different elements and molecules give off, when you heat them up to certain frequencies, they give off different frequencies of light, and those frequencies happen to be in the visible range, that means they give off different colors. So demonstrate that. It's gonna happen when I shake it. Let's go. When I stop shaking, <laughs> yeah, slower than you will put the cold. <laughs> we'll just keep rewinding. Eventually, it'll go clear. There it is. All right. So this is another indicator reaction. It's not an acid-base indicator. It's an oxygen indicator. That blue color called methylene blue. For the folks at home, have you ever set up an aquarium before? There's a pretty good chance you bought methylene blue at the pet store. It's used to treat a disease that fish can't call it. In an oxygen-rich atmosphere, it's that bright blue color. 
but an oxygen depleted atmosphere, it turns clear. So the reaction between the sugar solution and the flask to begin with, the base that I added, uses up that oxygen, and so it goes clear. So as it will turn back to blue, every time I shake, because every time I shake, I'm putting in more oxygen. Again, for the, for the older students, for the adults, if you're really interested, that process, the actual chemical reaction, kind of mimics how our bodies take in oxygen and process it. So again, so we can demonstrate that visual. All right, so we'll turn the lights off now. This one is all about the colors. So demonstrate that concept of different compounds giving off different frequencies of light and the visible range of different colors. We heat them up. What I've got here are six different metal salts. We add some methanol for fuel. We have potassium chloride, indium chloride, copper chloride, sodium chloride, strontium chloride, and lithium chloride. I might have misspoke. The first one's potassium. So for safety, we're going to put fuel way over here. Now I'm going to take a match, and when I light each of these at first, you might just see the blue from the methanol burning. But as they heat up, we should see the characteristic colors for each of those metals. We should see violet for potassium, blue for the indium, green for the copper, yellow for the sodium, orange for the strontium, nice bright, cherry red for the lithium. Now the, blue, the violet, the yellow, and the orange are coming in pretty quick. The copper, the green, and the lithium, the bright red, usually take a little bit longer to heat up. But again, as they heat up, you should, you should get a nice, distinct set of colors there. Now you guys have actually observed this phenomenon before. If you've got a gas stove at home, what color is the flame on your gas stove? Blue. If you go camping, you've got a nice wood fire, nice charcoal, charcoal fire, that's a nice bright yellowish orange, like that the sodium, because wood has a fair amount of sodium in it, so it, so it gives off that characteristic sodium yellow color. Now while these are heating up, I'm going to start another demonstration and see if we can tie the two of the demonstrations together. Now this one actually has some important applications for things like fire safety, uh, fighting forest fires and things like that. This one is called the fire tornado. Now, the idea is if you're a firefighter fighting a forest fire, try and say that five times fast. If you're a firefighter fighting a forest fire, a lot of times that forest fire will start off as just a small little fire down at the base of the trees. But if the wind whips up just right or just wrong, that little fire can quickly get whipped into a vortex into the fire tornado. And that becomes a much more difficult fire to put out. That means the top of the trees, the canopy of the forest on fire, this fire should rapidly over the firefighters' heads, but it's much harder for them to get to it. Uh, but the older students, the adults, if you watched the, any of the news last summer about the wildfires in California, there was a spectacular video, of, and a really horrifying video, of like seven, eight story tall fire tornadoes just sort of ripping through some of the canyons and things. Here's that nice little tame domesticated fire tornado, so it's not quite as scary. Now, you've observed this phenomenon before, only upside down. You ever taken like an empty two liter soda bottle, turn it upside, fill it with water, stretch it out, and spun it around? Think about what you've observed. Does the water cloud faster or slower when you spun the bottle around? Remember, it came out faster because it created a hole in the center that allowed the air to get into the bottle without bumping into the air, and then the water could escape out the edge, around the edge of the river, where it could also pass the air without bumping into it. Faster. Same similar concept here, you're creating a column of hot air, hot air rising, so it rises quickly and that's a sucks in fresh air from the sides, pulling in more oxygen, and that feeds the flame. Now again, I said I got an idea of how we put these two together, so I'm going to put out my fire dish, and then replace that with a slightly modified fire dish. I said before, all of our specialized glass here was made by our glass board building right now, all of our specialized uh, metal work was done by our machinist, Will Seymour. I really like working with those guys. Really smart, really creative. Um, if you're interested in a career where you use math and science, if you also want to do things with your hands and build things and be creative in that way, things like class floor, things like machinist, are some fun, interesting uh, opportunities to consider. Now, what Will did for me was he took one of those big fire dishes and he divided it into four smaller compartments for me. So I think I'm going to have to grab my phone here to set see where I'm going with this. Just need my flashlight. So what he did was he divided it into four smaller compartments. So we're going to get 
a smaller fire tornado. What will hopefully be interesting is each one of those compartments has one of our four salts in it. Two of them have copper chloride. Remember, that's the green one. Two of them have lithium chloride. That's the cherry red one. So once they heat up, we should get a nice red and green candy striped fire tornado. Uh, just like the candy dish, it's going to take a minute to get heated. So you'll have to be a little bit patient. But I think we'll be able to. see little flares of green and red, but they'll be much brighter. Which 
one was loud. Second one. Now, we might turn the lights off and say, which we might not have been able to see. But the next question is, which one had the bigger fireball? And you may not have been able to see because the lights were But the first one actually had the bigger fireball. Because it didn't have any oxygen mixed in. It had to go out into the air to get the oxygen. The reaction was a split second slower. The fireball was bigger. The second one had the oxygen already mixed in, so it could react instantly. If you were in the room, you would have felt a concussion wave as it hit you. All right, go, uh, actually, let me do the oxygen one first. Uh, that will show you enough on its own even the lights on. All right, they'll turn off the lights. Okay, so first one's pure hydrogen, seventh hydrogen plus a little bit of oxygen. This one's pure oxygen. Yeah, I gotta do this one for the sake of Everyone cover your ears, please. Cover your ears, please. Because <laughs> what did I tell you all? Gotta have, what are the three things you gotta have for, for a fire? You gotta have heat, oxygen, and fuel. No fuel, no boom. Some of you at home might remember, might be old enough from way back in the day when you saw people smoke in the hospital, which makes no sense at all. But if you're in an oxygen tank, you can't smoke in the oxygen tank because it would blow up. It would not blow up. The problem is in a pure oxygen environment, what's gonna happen? The teeniest, tiniest spark hits the sheets, the curtains, anything. Oh, gonna burn almost instantly. Um, now, I think I, I think I actually skipped saying, but usually earlier in the show I talked about there being, we live in about a 20%, at, 20, 22% atmosphere of oxygen. For all my colleagues in that area of chemistry tell me, if we lived in like a 32 or 42% atmosphere of oxygen, um, people couldn't be driving their cars and trucks around basically, because your tailpipes would rust off before you got out of the driveway. We live in just the right atmosphere of oxygen, the reactions have a basically a useful rate for life, but not so fast as have to boom over and done. Alright, now that you're expecting to hit those lights. Alright. So same thing. Don't touch the balloon, just get it close enough to pop it. Thank you for joining us virtually this year. I hope you can join us in person next year.